I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Imagine, if you will, a group of strangers comes to you and offers you a better life. A life without disease or poverty. A life with technology beyond your wildest dreams. But at what cost? What would you give these strangers to have all this? Would it be worth it? And how far would you go to receive these gifts? In 1983, these questions were posed to the American TV viewers when the original miniseries V hit the airways and immediately struck a chord, creating a deep philosophical debate that has continued to engage its fans for over 37 years. V presented the following scenario. What if benevolent aliens were to arrive on Earth and promise cures to horrible diseases, poverty, and gifts of technology that could benefit humanity for decades or more? However, in this case, the humans soon learned that these aliens were not as benevolent as they first thought, as they persecute a different class of people and ultimately reveal that their promises were empty, leading to the most terrifying of reveals. One that was so shocking that it would horrify viewers for decades to come. This show not only made us think about the dangers of fascism, but also displayed some groundbreaking makeup, marketing, and special effects that would go on to influence many industry professionals. Even though some of you younger folks may not know or even remember this show, it helped prove to viewers that science fiction could be more than just ray guns and spaceships. The demand for new content in the V franchise would create a series of novels, comic books, computer games, a manga, and even a remake in 2009, with debatable results in quality. But with such a controversial show, could V possibly come back in our day and age? Could the visitor ships once again hover over our cities with an extended hand of peace, but also with a big case of the munchies? Let us find out in this installment of Gone But Not Forgotten. Now before we get started, we cannot talk about V without treading into some political territory. No matter how much I try, this is going to eventually lead to some kind of political implications. So if any of you think that would be something you don't want to deal with, then I suggest you turn off this video and go watch V on your own, because it is an excellent show that everyone should watch. Okay, now that that's out of the way, let us delve deep into the excellent V franchise, which was created by the equally excellent producer, writer, and director, Kenneth Johnson, who was a producer of The Six Million Dollar Man and the creator of its iconic spin-off, The Bionic Woman, and who we covered before on the previous Gone But Not Forgotten episode on The Incredible Hulk. In 1983, Johnson read and became inspired to create a movie based on the 1935 dystopian fantasy novel by Sinclair Lewis entitled It Can't Happen Here. While he was having dinner with NBC executive Brandon Tartikoff, Johnson mentioned his script for this movie. And after reading the script, Brandon convinced Johnson to turn it into a miniseries for NBC. However, he told Johnson that he didn't think a younger audience would be able to follow or believe in such a heady premise of fascism happening in America from a political group located in the United States of America. Um, can we just sort of... <laughs> anyway, Tartikoff proposed the idea of aliens being the ones who would set into motion the rise of fascism in America and the rest of the world. And at first, Johnson was offended by this idea. But the more he thought about it, the more he realized that Brandon was right. By making the villains in the story aliens, he could appeal to a broader audience. And by making it a science fiction show, he could not only get the intellectual viewers he was aiming for, but teenagers and young adults as well. Now, the main plot of the original series goes as follows. One day, giant spaceships began to appear on the Earth. And the world is wrapped in wonder as the aliens, or visitors as they are soon named by the masses, introduce themselves as bringers of peace. They make a deal with the world's governments to help them mine the planet for a mineral which is abundant on Earth, one which they desperately need to survive. And in exchange, they will share with us their technology that will cure diseases and propel human society forward by hundreds of years. But soon things begin to take a turn as the visitors turn the public against the scientists, who they see as a threat to them for possibly exposing their ulterior motives. And so the public soon begins to persecute the scientists. 
they're shunned by their neighbors, and anyone associated with them will be threatened both economically and physically. And one by one, the scientists begin to mysteriously disappear. Now many people began to realize what is beginning to happen, particularly the character who I actually became very attached to in this show, Abraham Bernstein, played by Leonardo Cimino. I don't know if it's because I'll always remember him as the scary German guy from the Monster Squad, but every scene of his just stirred such emotion in my heart. Bernstein is told by his family that he shouldn't worry, that the visitors are helping humanity, and their influence in society is for the better with the visitors having no effect in how they all live. But Bernstein is a Holocaust survivor who has heard all of this before in Germany and who knows what is about to come. Chimino ends up stealing every scene that he's in. He doesn't even have to say a line and you're just glued to his facial expressions. In fact, there's one scene in particular which made me cry for days. I couldn't even think about this scene without getting emotional. It's when the Bernstein scientist's neighbors are being hunted down by the visitors, and Abraham tells them to hide in his garage. Abraham's son confronts his dad because he knows how dangerous it would be for them if the family gets discovered, and that's when Leonardo Cimino gives us the most powerful scene of the show, where he tells his son that had someone hidden their family in a garage during the Holocaust, his mother may still be alive and that the last time he saw her alive was when she was being marched towards the ovens. Truly powerful stuff. I would recommend you watch this miniseries just for this one scene. Now it's not just people who see the visitors as a threat who get attention in this series. A lot of characters begin to be manipulated by the visitors and gleefully take orders from them, namely Daniel Bernstein, Abraham's grandson, who becomes an enthusiastic follower of the visitors. He joins their human army and soon becomes so power hungry that he does some really despicable things. Like in this scene where he tells his family what he's going to do with the teenage daughter of the scientist in the garage. See, I want her. Uh, just like I wanted this champagne. And I will get her, won't I? Otherwise, I'll just have to turn her whole damn family in. first part of the miniseries ends with a kick-ass scene where Abraham encounters a group of kids doing graffiti on one of the visitors' posters. No! If you're going to do it, do it right. I'll show you. understand for victory this is a pretty interesting scene because johnson was heavily involved in the marketing for the miniseries and used a viral marketing campaign something which was not really used back then leading up to the series premiere posters would be put up which featured the slogan the visitors are our friends and then days later would have the v symbol spray painted on them by the marketing team this strategy ended up working wonders, and it is pretty amazing that viral marketing is now the standard for most promotions after V was one of the first uses of it. The main protagonist of this entire franchise would be Mike Donovan, played by the Beastmaster himself, Mark Singer. Donovan is the first to discover that the visitors are not the peaceful aliens that they present themselves to be, but rather rat-eating lizard monsters whose goal is to drain the earth of all of its water and, most horrifying of all, use us as food. Donovan tries to expose the visitors, but is stopped, and ends up becoming public enemy number one. He is hunted throughout the entire series while also having to deal with his power-hungry mother and searching for his kidnapped son. Then there are other characters, like Juliet Parrish, played by Faye Grant, who would eventually become the reluctant leader of the Resistance against the Visitors. And what I love most about this miniseries is how complex it is, as characters who are built up as possible series regulars end up dying, and then get replaced by characters you thought were secondary. There is some real character development here, although some may argue that it's not as nuanced as other great TV shows from the past. The villains are really cool as well, the most famous of course being Diana, played by the gorgeous Jane Badler, 
Diana had aspects that we'd never seen before in a female character, like the fact that she was clearly bisexual, or that she was more diabolical and clever than other femme fatales of the time period. And the show really built up the rivalry between her and Steven, the security chief of the visitors. Steven was a real snake, uh, pun not intended, as he would seduce Donovan's mother with promises of power that eventually convinced her to betray her son. Plus, the first V miniseries has some impressive stunt work that made me think of how these kinds of stunts would never be done in a million years nowadays. I mean, just take a look at how close this helicopter comes to the actors. Yeah, it's no wonder that in the same year the V miniseries aired, stunt work like this would lead to the Twilight Zone movie tragedy. Another character that really stands out here is Willie, a visitor who was so sweet, awkward, and cute that he should have had plushies made out of him. He ends up saving one of the characters who had started out acting really mean towards Willie when the intergalactic immigrant starts a new job at a chemical plant, all while having to struggle with speaking English. Help, please. Help what? I am just. Just what? Yes. Help to go to this place. I'm just. Oh, you don't know where to go. I'm just. You're lost. Lost. Yeah, isn't that cute? Hey, wait, haven't I seen this guy before? God, I know I have. <laughs> Please, God. This is God. Ah! No! Get him away from me! Don't let him near me! Ah! <laughs> it's okay. He can't get me if I don't sleep. In fact, according to Kev Johnson, Robert England actually gets asked more about his character from V than he does Freddy Krueger. <laughs> yeah, sure, Ken. Sure. Whatever you say. Anyway, the first miniseries was great and proved so popular that it got 40% of the viewership for that week. I don't know about you, but to finish watching a 200 minute miniseries on TV back when there was no DVR or streaming services, that is a big accomplishment. So obviously V was a hit, and a sequel was all but inevitable, leading to the creation of V, the final battle in 1984. However, Kenneth Johnson was unhappy with what the network wanted to do with this sequel, so they moved forward without him. And in my opinion, Final Battle was not as good as the original. Uh, don't get me wrong, I still think it's a good show, but it does kind of get a little silly at times. This is especially noticeable with the returning character of Robin Maxwell, played by Blair Tefkin. Originally, this character was supposed to be played by Poltergeist star Dominique Dunn, but tragically, after only five days into shooting the original miniseries, Dunn was murdered in cold blood by her ex-boyfriend. The character of Robin becomes pregnant after having sex with a visitor named Brian, whom she develops a big crush on. And this subplot will become a big part of the final battle after leading to this scene. You can't make the girl go through this for some high-minded notion? Fortune is murder. I don't care. I'd rather die than have this thing. Look, this baby could turn out to be a ray of hope. A symbol of peace between our species. The potential is just too great to be ignored. And so are the dangers. We can't take responsibility for Robin. It's her body. It's her decision. Can you believe that? No matter how you fall on that issue, it is impressive how in 1984, a primetime science fiction event had a discussion about abortion. Pretty impressive indeed. But even though Robin decides to move forward with the abortion, she can't go through with it, because when they try aborting the child, it almost ends up killing her. And she eventually gives birth to a serpent-like little baby girl. But then it turns out it's twins and... Warning, the following clip will make you laugh so hard that you may stop breathing. Your discretion is advised. What is it? I don't know! Oh my god! Yeah, I think you could tell when this show jumped the shark. Still, even though the final battle did get a little goofy, it had one thing that helped it stand out from the original. 
motherfucking Michael Ironside. Ironside played the role of rebel fighter Ham Tyler, who was a wild card, and a pretty fucking crazy one at that. He did things that no sane person would do, like almost blowing himself up while trying to cave in a building that would kill a whole bunch of visitors. You could not trust this guy. One minute he'd be fighting alongside you, and the next he'd be trying to steal a biological weapon to use it behind your back. This character was kind of like a mix between Wolverine and Sabretooth. So yeah, the Resistance eventually figures out how to make a biological weapon, which will kill any of the visitors who have not taken a vaccine beforehand to protect themselves. V the Final Battle. Like I said, it was a good series, but it went off the rails after introducing Robin's daughter, the Star Child, who at the end of the miniseries is revealed to have magical, bad special effect energy powers. But yet again, the second V miniseries was another hit that destroyed everything else airing that night. So yet another sequel was again unavoidable. Enter V, the TV series, which would run for 19 episodes before eventually getting cancelled. And worst of all, it ended with a cliffhanger. Again, this TV series had its own charm, but not nearly as good as the original miniseries. You could tell that this show was struggling with production costs at times, using the same flying footage from the miniseries and reusing the same sets. Still, there were some good stories to be had. The premise of the show was that the biological weapon that the Resistance had used, also known as the Red Dust, has now become unstable in parts of the world, giving the visitors the ability to wage war on and even conquer parts of the world. And it turns out that if they use more of this red dust, it will end up killing everyone, as the dust has now mutated and is no longer safe to humans. The series would introduce some new villains, like Diana's rival Lydia, played by Lane Smith, and the slimy envoy to the mysterious leader of the visitors, Charles, played by Duncan Regeer. Hey, wait, I know this guy too, but from where? Give me the amulet, you bitch! Oh, motherfucker! Oh, they got me again! God damn it! Oh, Jesus, stop doing that! But even though there were interesting stories and characters, the show could be corny at times, like the amount of 80s rock band hair, or the fact that Diana always seemed to be an expert at putting her hands on her hips constantly whenever she tried to be threatening. Still, even though V the TV series is flawed, I would still give it a watch, though. And after the show's cancellation, the show's fan base grew even larger over time, with fans hoping that Kenneth Johnson would be given the opportunity to continue his vision for the franchise, which he would later turn into two novels. Sadly, Warner Bros. decided to do a V reboot instead that aired on ABC in 2009. This reboot was just okay, in my opinion. It had some good acting and some decent scripts, but it was a bit of a mess in trying to find its footing. Some of the characters were interesting, but the other characters were not so great. For example, the son of the main protagonist was such an annoying brat that he dragged down the entire show. This new series would end up lasting two seasons, and although it eventually did get better, it was too little, too late. Fans tried to save it with a letter writing campaign, but it didn't work. And for the second time, the final season of the V series ended with yet another unresolved cliffhanger. So, million dollar question, should the show come back? Well, of course! Just watch the first miniseries and you'll agree with me. However, can it come back? Well, that's an interesting question, because according to Kev Johnson, a movie version of V is in the works, although it has had some ups and downs throughout development. Sadly, to my knowledge, there is no place where you can watch any of this franchise for free in order to watch the original miniseries, the final battle, the original series, or even the reboot, you will have to pay for it. Still, if you have the ability to do so, I would recommend you should. But remember to beware of strangers throughout the world or from beyond the stars who offer you friendship and gifts, because if you're not careful, the price may end up being far too high. Flying saucers everywhere, city.